That is such a beautiful song, and, and I almost feel like I shouldn't interrupt because it goes into the concluding track, Historians, on the album Historian, uh, so beautifully, but uh, we have to make room for a conversation here with uh, Lucy Dacus, who uh, wrote and recorded that unbelievable song. Um, it's a song about the, the, the passing, the death of her, her grandmother, and, you know, some people make fun of me because I have these songs about people... Uh, passing away that are really powerful songs that ring with me. Uh, Jane Sibri's Vigil, um, Death Cab for Cuties, What Sarah Said, Hamel on Trials, Open Up the Gates, and now this one, uh, Pillar of Truth. Uh, Lucy Dacus is coming to town to perform finally for us here in Ottawa at City Folk on the 15th of uh, September, and she joins me on the line right now to talk about, well, we could talk about this song for about a half hour, but I'll keep it to a couple of <laughs> minutes. Um, welcome to the show again, uh, Lucy yeah, thank you. Hopefully this time the show won't be as ill-fated as the other, but thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope our program's not the jinx here or anything to your Ottawa appearances. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it is, next time you have one, don't call. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I'll have learned a lesson. Yes. That song, um, there's so many interesting things going on in it, but one of the first things I, I want to talk to you about is... Um, how challenging or difficult was it to 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 write this song about your grandmother, who obviously it appears to me from this song was such a, an important kind of part of your life, the idea that you see her as a pillar of truth? Yeah, I've always found that writing is never difficult and sharing is the hard part. And so writing was actually the easiest thing I did that week. You know, I was writing it in the room next to her in her house, all of us as a family gathered around her from all of the different states that we've moved to. Um, and being able to write about it was like the thing that kept me focused or like it gave me an outlet when like I couldn't really talk to the family because I didn't know what I thought yet. Right. You know, like I often when things are really tough, like it takes time to figure out the words to express how you feel and so like i was thankful to you know have a guitar and be able to talk to myself in an organized way um and then i, I did show it to her um like right before she passed and um it, it remains like one of the most meaningful music moments of of my life and i i think that it's extra like it's bonus that other people have heard it and other people can, can use it. Um, yeah, like it, it fulfilled its purpose to me early on. So that adds an amazing new layer to me as a, as a listener that, that you presented it to her. You didn't, you didn't sing it to her. Did you, you just presented the words to her? I sang it to her cause I showed it to my dad and he was like, you have to show it to her. And she had had a, a stroke at the time, so she couldn't react. Right. Um, or she could, but it, her words, in, it's actually in the song. It's like your, uh, is it your words are broken or, mm -hmm. um, yep. it's like at the top of the song and, uh, yeah, but it being able to make something for her when I feel like she was such a servant to all of us, like she was always so mild and humble and so she had five kids. She from Mississippi and she was kind of like the, the typical like serving housewife. Mm -hmm. And, um, so to, to serve her in something felt, felt really good. I'm, I'm curious at, at one point in the song, are you changing voice from you, the observer to perhaps being her or the person who's passing or you in the future, even maybe it seems like the voice changes in the song. Yeah, I yeah, I, I tried to become her. I tried to like see through her eyes and like imagine you know she, she was such like a a merciful person. Um so like we we were all looking at her, but I tried to think about what she was seeing and by looking at us. Um Right. So yeah, I'm glad that you caught that. 
Well, the the other thing that is so striking in this recorded version, and I've watched a couple of live versions online too, and I can just see you building to, to this, trying to, I, I I think trying to make sure you nail it so well. But you do so well in the song where you, where you do the line where if my throat can't sing, then my soul will. And you pause there. There's a pregnant pause from the group. Boom! Will scream to you or at you to you out to you. So that is a very powerful point. How did that come to you to to want to make that expression and and to do it in that way? Because it's really poignant. Um, it's actually a reference to a hymn. Um, that the the lyric of the hymn is like, if my soul can't speak, then my heart sings to you, or it's something oh, okay. like that. I feel. I, I used to have it memorized. I feel silly that I can't remember it word for word right now. So it, it's speak and then sing. And so, like, I changed it to sing right. and then scream. Um, and I, I felt that, like, like that was maybe something that she had never had access to. And so I imagine her and her next life just being able to let l- loose, you know, like, she all she was a singer. She was a piano player, a piano teacher. Right, right. The music was always at hand, um, but to to scream and like really express herself, I don't know if she ever did. Um, and so I I guess I I wanted to imagine her <laughs> screaming out out of joy or out of um, out of nothing. You know, just being able to do something that is uncontrolled. Um, and I, I really, that made me happy to think of. Now, I, I told, you know, I, I lied at the start and said, we're not going to talk about this for the whole interview, but I want to ask you one last question about that song. I've watched a couple of versions yeah. where you're playing it online and like one of them in, in particular alive. And, and it's like, you're in this really bright lit room and everybody's talking at the beginning. And I'm going like, Oh my God, I'd go out of my mind. If I was at that gig, people are talking during this song. Mm-hmm. They need to shut up. <laughs> um, is it hard for you? especially doing a song like that so personal to focus past chatter in a room when you're trying to deliver that song or or have you got that down to a a science now? I'm really spoiled. I think often people don't talk when I'm playing, um, but occasionally we'll, you know, open for a band and um, maybe like the fans, we don't really have a lot of overlap. Um, or maybe it is just a really rowdy situation, like festivals. People go to festivals for the festival sometimes instead of the music, you know, and that's fine. And I I think I just know that I did that. And I also really value people coming into the room to be together no matter what they're going to do. Right. And, like, I go to a show, and not loudly, but I, I talk to friends. You know, I'm there to commune with a community, Um and so I, I try to never pass judgment on people who talk at shows unless I see that they're really ruining it for other people. Mm. And then I, very occasionally I've had to be like, hey, I, I'm doing a thing. Or like, <laughs> um, please, <laughs> I, I don't know what I've said. I, I feel like I try to be polite, but um, that hardly ever happens because if people are, are talking and being joyful together, like I, I try to get out of the way. Right. I found it interesting a couple of things like th- that you said uh, I've I've come across about the uh, the new album like a song like I can't remember if it's if it was this one or another one that you'd worked on for for five years and what, you're what twenty four now are you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So like if for for an old guy like me, it just seems mind boggling for somebody twenty four to have worked on a song for for five years. <laughs> it's like oh my God, that's like <laughs> that's like a a quarter to a fifth of your life working on on a, a song you mentioned that about a couple of songs on this recording but that and then then that you said that it was it was forming your band that helped you to bring some of them together how was that was that the input needed from somebody else other than yourself yeah i think that since writing has always been for myself and not really for other people i i don't really see the use of some songs beyond myself like the way i talked about pillar of truth like the use of that was very apparent to me personally and it's kind of been wild to see it have any use for anybody else so sometimes i'll write a song and it's used to me has been completed so i don't think oh i should share this so 
to share things I make with the people around me, people whose opinions I respect, they can kind of like pull those songs out of the mire of my memory and like tell me like, no, that one's actually worthwhile. Um, and like also saying that I worked on a song for five years, it's not like writing a novel. Like I didn't sit down to it every day. <laughs> it's just that I wrote a couple lines and then I didn't for a while. And then I wrote a couple other lines and it, it's shape didn't really take place for a couple of years, you know, and that just takes, it's not like a lot of really strenuous effort has gone into that. Right. Um, it's more like very, um, very long-term patience has to be in place and um, to not feel like the song needs to be done. There are some songs even in the process right now that I guess I've technically been writing for like seven years, but the fact is they may never be finished and that's fine Right. because the process of writing whatever couple lines I did, like I found out something about myself and that's, that's all I need. Um, and beyond that, it's, it's just a gift. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to hear you talking about this and, and to have read a few uh, interviews with you because I really like the kind of, and it's it's not like arrogance or anything, but this certain certainty and calm about you, about your writing and about your process and about getting your art out to the world. It all seems very, it seems so natural with you, the way you talk about it. Oh, huh, that's really good to know. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I do, I, I like to think about this stuff abstractly a lot. You know, I'm, I'm theorizing in my head, in my free time, like, what type of person am I going to be, like, and how can I do best by people, and how can I communicate most clearly, and I guess, like, maybe I just made some decisions a while ago that I haven't really had to rethink um, when it comes to, like, communication and who I am, and, like, I rethink stuff all the time, but with things like this, like, I do feel this sort of purity of intention that carries me through it in a, a way that's really light um so it's cool that that comes across absolutely the, the other thing too i mean again this you know us old people who've been around for a while and stuff we're always i think we, we get maybe overly amazed by this but the insights uh that your words bring to certain things like like your grandmother and other things on this album i mean and and death pops up several times on this album and I and not I wouldn't say complacency but an acceptance of death that you don't expect that of somebody in their early 20s to be so um accepting of but, but it, and it's not just that it's other things within your lyrics that that almost seem to me to speak to and this might sound stupid but like that you've got an old soul in you already that you that you you have a, a respect and a reverence and an understanding of life that maybe some of us who've been around a lot longer don't have yet and it's then reflected to us through your art that that's cool and it's true people have told me that i'm an old soul for a while and i don't really know what it means but i do very much look forward to being old um i don't really know why like I'm going gray and I feel really good about it. And I, I really respect like the elders in my life and just seeing them having lived like a full experience. I'm like, wow, to contain that much. I, I feel like I, it's not like I can't wait. I'm going to wait, but um, I, I try to cultivate positivity towards it. Cause I think it's really easy to fear aging. Um, so it takes practice, I guess. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'll get dumber. Like, <laughs> it, I could very easily just get a lot dumber over time. And, like, talking about, um, like, yeah, a lot of my songs are about death and, like, trying to be at peace with it. And that's something I come in and out of, you know. And I think maybe as you get older, you have different stressors. Like, I don't even have kids. Right. So I don't even know what life will bring if that ever happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I am glad to have written some songs to remind myself that I felt that way at that time and so maybe I can access that and it, it's encouraging to sing them well that's the thing about I, I, I think and it's, it sounds snobby in a way but I think the best art and the best music is created by someone who's creating it first for themselves 
but somehow it makes a connection and, and, and your music does that. You're a person who reads a lot from what I understand too. Does, do you think that, that all the literature that you take in helps you with, with your own craft of creating your own words? Yeah, for sure. I definitely am more inspired by books than anything else. Um, I don't really know. It's it's hard to talk about that specifically just because, like, reading books is such a personal thing. Right. Um, and, like, you can't do it communally. Like, you can have a book club and each be having separate experiences and kind of compare notes, but still, like, it's it's like having a dream where like what you see and what you feel it can actually never be shared mm. um and so i guess in writing music the way it feels to write it the reasons why i write it i can actually never show, share those i can share the song but um i never have to worry about giving everything away cuz i couldn't even if i wanted to right right we have to make way for another show here coming up at six o'clock. So um, I, okay. I'd like, I, I could talk to you forever. You're, you're, it's, it's very interesting to talk to you about your music. I, I was going to play either Forever Half Mast or something else from Historian that you might want to pick. Do you want to go with Forever Half Mast or something else at this point in the conversation? Sure. Forever Half Mast is like the newest one. So it, it's, it's definitely, um, it's a, about how I feel right now, so go for that one. And is is it risky as an American artist to put a song out like that at this stage of the game? Because your country feels so polarized, like really harshly polarized. Yeah, I think the only risk, because like I, I, I don't feel like I have to fear someone coming for me about that. My only risk is like alienating instead of including right. people that disagree with me. Right. Um, cause I, w- I would really hate to like have the people that I would like to, t- to speak with tune out because of something like that. So that's the biggest risk is to like polarize further. Um, but there's no risk, like people being like, this is too edgy or this is like, I, I don't worry about that. Um, but I do hope that people like find it and like, either take solace in it or f- find it compassionate instead of like angry, even though I'm, I am angry, but, um, whatever. I'll, I'll stop there. Lucy Dake, it's a pleasure to meet you on the radio again and, and looking forward to seeing you here yeah. in Ottawa on the 15th at, at our city folk festival. Likewise. Okay. Take care. Yeah. I'm excited. First time. Thanks so much for the time today. Appreciate it. That's Lucy Dacus. This is Forever Half Mast. You can see her at City Folk on the 15th, and it's going to be a real...